Okay, this is Perak Zion, uh, part se- chapter seven of Chachmas uh, Hakodesh, Chelak Aleph, Perak Zion. It's called Hasodiut Hakolelet. Um, just a little kind of a context here, so we kind of know where we are. So we've been discussing so far the entire Chelak, uh, the first part of the Oras Hakodesh, really focuses a lot on, um, I guess you can call it structure, which is kind of like to sort of know the framework where we where we are and what this kind of how this kind of structured, and we've been discussing in the previous videos about how there's uh, there's intangible reality that kind of translates and manifests as the tangible reality, and that tangible reality is measurable. Intangible reality is something which you can't really grasp with your bina, with your calculating side, the side that can actually measure things, but that you can encounter. Um, experientially was something called your da'as and the word da'as also means perception because that these things are intrinsically uh, the same thing that your perception is something which is it's the light within which you see things it's the ability to sort of overlay intangible meaning or or value or connection between things that are tangible um, and to say well this tangible thing and this tangible thing they both kind of are manifestations of or, or representations of something which is intangible, so that's what we call in very classic cultural English, uh, things that have sentimental values, and one way to sort of describe that, but when you do with people, so, I mean, this is just a body, and yet somehow uh, there's me kind of coming through that, and just like, you know, an object can mean something to us, we have different things in our lives that we that we see as expressions of or extensions of some kind of underlying meaning, an intangible meaning. So that's, uh, that's really what we're talking about with das and deot, which means perceptions. So this section is going to kind of continue to build on top of the previous parts, and I just want to sort of show where it's, what it's referencing. So we've already been discussing how in that structure of intangible kind of translating down into tangible, that's like the total meta framework that we're working with. We tend to think of this world as the world around us or something, and then there's there's the heavens or other you know religious language people use shamayim va'aretz and but the totality of what we call existence according to the Jewish perspective is is all of it as one it's kind of like it's one giant system and Hashem is beyond all that Hashem is not in the shamayim he's not over there somewhere um, Hashem is the source of the totality of reality and the totality of reality is not just the finite world and not just uh, the intangible world it's all one framework one matrix one structure. Um, that is, it's all, you know, each part is very much a, a piece of the of the story and of reality. And so when you kind of get exposed to that, it's a very descriptive way of thinking about things, kind of like, here's how things kind of look. And then uh, there are some parts of how things look that are easier, easier to think about because we're more culturally or, or otherwise trained to think in those kinds of ways. So it's easy to think about mathematics for some of us, easy to think about scientific uh, recordable facts. And there's things that are intangible, which some people, by the way, Eastern philosophies, uh, Eastern perspectives, easily incorporate intangible and experiential truths. And depending on what your, you know, natural uh, tendencies are, how you grew up and what you're exposed to, so structures of thinking are going to correlate with certain parts of the structure of reality. You'll You'll be able to more easily think about certain things as opposed to other things. And then when you get exposed to things that you're not used to thinking about, it'll stretch you and uh, make it a little more difficult as you get used to it, then you'll become more and more adept at thinking in uh, different parts of the structure. So the idea here is this is talking about what's called hasodiut kolela. That really means, um, if, again, working with that same structure of reality. So we just spoke about how we are microcosmic versions of that larger macrocosmic structure, which is that every person is, uh, is an intangible self that is translated through varying, uh, increasing... Uh, let's say layers of ta- of increasing tangibleness, tangibility, and then getting ultimately down to like the most tangible, which is what you see is what you can measure. Um, and so there, that was mentioned in earlier videos as well. For those who uh, want to see more about that, you can check the previous parts of the series. Um, so the so the, the that, that word is really referencing um, the intangible side of the microcosmic human analogy for the macrocosmic structure. In other words, your intangible side. So if this is you, just like this is reality, and you're a parallel version of that, it'll structure the same way. Um, so your intangible side is what we'll call your internal world. 
uh, your internal world, also called sometimes in uh, some some books, like to use phrases like, especially in English, the word inner space was a name of a book written by Rabbi Arya Kaplan that uh, tries to describe the structure of the internal world using all the analogies, analogies of Kabbalah uh, very explicitly. Those are all analogies. Those who have read that book, it is not literal. Um, but uh, the idea here, so the Yud is referencing the, the, that internal world, that those are the things that, again, that are inside of us that are extremely central, very important, that many of us run from those things because we don't understand them. We're scared of them. I don't want to approach my own fears, my own insecurities, my own my own biases, my own warped perspectives, my own upbringing. If, if I have people telling me about how they see me, how I seem to come across, I get scared and worried. Um, all those internal things that we usually reference with things like introspection or tikkun amidos, these are all more cultural terminologies trying to relate to this area in a more isolated or less contextualized way. So that's the internal world that we're talking about. It's secret, but not secret because uh, we're keeping it secret. It's secret because it's hidden. It's not, uh, it's not um, overt. It's not right in front of you. So it stays in the background. And so we're going to sort of see how that whole aspect of human existence, how it is hidden, how we tend to avoid it. Masil Sisharim, for those who are familiar with that book, uh, The Path of the Just, it's translated, it's a very poor translation uh, phrase, it's not really translated well as Path of the Just. But Masil Sisharim, literally the path of the straight, um, it's uh, a book that really references a lot about how the things that are the most important for our development as selves and to become the most uh, integrated and, and effective in our lives, are the things that are usually ignored and that we tend to run from uh, and hide from because they're so painful. We actually structure our psychologies in ways that help us to avoid having to face our own inner problems um, because they're so, uh, um, we, we really just want to avoid them. And uh, if you just face them, you become so strong. And yet, because of the way that we structure and our insecurities and our fears, we don't do that so easily. So let's just read a little bit and sort of see how this fits together. We're going to compare, really, uh, the approach of Sodiut to regular philosophy in this in this piece, try to create a contrast that can help us to understand uh, where kind of one is and where what the other one is. And I'll just stress at the beginning, that, you know, at the, at the outset over here, that uh, uh, this is not philosophy, what we're teaching in this uh, series. This sort of co all of our are not philosophy. Uh, we're going to see exactly in what way they're not. But philosophy is a very restricted, very disconnected uh, field, um, depending on the aspects of philosophy and the things that are taught. Again, you can have people that are teaching what they'll call philosophy, but are actually these things. But the classical philosophical uh, ideas um, uh, suffer from a certain problem, which of Cook is going to reference here, uh, and to kind of give us a good contrast to help us figure out what it is that we're doing that's particularly unique or effective. Let's see. So philosophy kind of only encompasses um, just parts of the intangible world that are like kind of known, kind of well known. We'll just pick an example. Uh, the issue of morality is a good example. Um, often discussed, really thrown around quite a bit. Um, so often discussed that people are very comfortable uh, with, even with the idea of morality, there being things that are right and wrong and, and being a moral person. And uh, it's a funny thing because again, when things are so often discussed and so part of the, the, the nomenclature of a particular culture, so then you just, uh, you get a situation where people might not even know anymore what it is they even mean when they say something is moral or immoral and where are the holes in the arguments because it's kind of like you come in, there's just a thing called morality. We all know that. So that's a good starting point. Let's talk about it now. But it's not such an obvious thing. There's such a thing called morality. And uh, we're going to talk about that a little more. But the idea here is that that's a known thing that people tend to talk about. And philosophy relates to that in a few other areas as well. So, but, but philosophy in its nature is detached, is disconnected from things that are outside of its boundaries. In other words, what it relates to, it relates to. And whatever is not part of that is off limits. We don't talk about that. And because of that, it in itself is, uh, is, is essentially, in a very uh, central kind of way, detached from you know, things that are, that it needs to really be attached to. It's just very separate. Sigula Akara, the, the way that our, our consciousness kind of like uh, evolves or, or changes. How all the perceptions and feelings and tendencies and habits kind of from their, from their earlier phases or smaller phases to their more broader developed phases are connected one to the other inside of us. And how they kind of influence each other. 
And how you'd have separate systems or structures or elements that can kind of get interwoven and interconnected and integrated with each other. Philosophy does not do that. It does not talk about those things in, a, in an effective way. Because, because it'll always be kind of like this, this logic of the aristocrats, the elite will think about philosophy. And it's because it's kind of like, it's this detached. We can talk about something from up above and be like, oh yeah, there's this idea. We'll talk about this idea or that idea. Um, but that's not really what it is that we're teaching here. We're talking about, or we'll describe what we're talking about in a second. That's only for people who are interested in that. Philosophy is only, only appealing to people who are interested in philosophy. The, the things that we're trying to teach here are not appealing to people who are interested in philosophy alone. They're appealing to everyone. Anyone who, anyone who hears these types of teachings are, as we said in earlier videos also, are going to be attracted to them. And there's a very specific reason why they're attracted to these things. See, philosophy and a lot of uh, related approaches that have a lot of philosophical underpinnings are what we can, which by the way, I would also argue that, um, that a lot of Jewish teachings are inherently philosophical in the following way. Philosophy is very proscriptive, which means it's trying to tell you what you should do. You should do this, you should do that, and, and, and there's some kind of underlying assumption, like it's because this is right, this is wrong, these are, what, these are things that should be done. And the funny thing is that we tend to think of the Torah as also being proscriptive in that way, trying to tell you what you should do, and if you don't follow the Torah, then you're not a good Torah person. And if you do follow the Torah, you're doing the right thing. And there's all kinds of different ways people will formulate that. But ultimately, it is proscriptive. That's what's happening there. And the problem with proscriptive things, by definition, things that are trying to tell you what to do, is that they are automatically going to be detached. Because you'll spend your whole life basically trying to internalize uh, these ideas to ultimately start to want what you're supposed to want according to the prescriptive system. So you're going to try to become a person who wants these things. You're told that you should want to put on tefillin, so I want to want that. That's kind of the way people will usually formulate it. I uh, Hopefully I'll be, eventually be able to want to want to eat kosher. I want to want to, to you know observe Shabbos or things like that. And that's a prescriptive perspective. It's that, well, I'm supposed to want that. I don't actually want it, but I know I'm supposed to, so I, hopefully I'll eventually want it and I'll work on it in some form or another. Maybe by practicing it a lot, and call it Jewish practice, if I practice enough, so then maybe I'll eventually get good at it, aka I'll start to actually like it or want it. And that's a real issue because it's a very detached perspective. That's something which is not about me, it's something which is just someone else, and you, you can call that someone else God, uh, or whatever term you want to give it, but it's ultimately giving an external prescription of what you should do. And that is very different than what the Torah is. The Torah is not a prescription. The Torah is actually a description and things that are described, they are, they are, the, the results, what should happen based on the description is implied. So just to sort of say that a little more clearly, as an analogy, if I'm walking on the street and someone passes by in their car and they roll down the window and say, hi, can you tell me how to get to 10th Avenue? So I say, well, what you're gonna do is you're gonna go left, you're gonna make a right after two blocks and you're gonna go forward another another five blocks later and there you make another left and then you're gonna see on the right side it's gonna be a little uh, bakery and right past that is gonna be 10th Avenue. So if the person then turns to me and says, hey, don't tell me what to do and they proceed to drive in the opposite direction, that's because they're interpreting what I'm saying as if it's prescriptive and telling them what they have to do. The tricky part there though is that anyone who's, uh, who's you know knows about giving directions, I'm not prescribing them to what to do. I'm saying to them, this is a description of what's going on, assuming you want the result of getting to 10th Avenue. The Torah is a, descript a description of reality, which basically, reality is a very fixed environment. Where we live, things are consistent. They work the same way. They always work the same way, largely speaking. The principles that connect human beings to each other, that make us work well, and that make us effective in life and, and successful, are largely fixed. Uh, trust, integrity, openness constancy, loyalty, these are principles of how human beings interact, and gravity and physics, and these are also principles that are pretty fixed, largely speaking, and then those are kind of like the rules of the game, and there are results that are implied if you follow the principles. No one's telling you you have to do this. In fact, in the Torah itself, it says that if you want to achieve the results of greater dynamism, uh, engagement, life, connection, then follow the path that the Torah lays out. But the path is just descriptive. Here is how reality looks. And if you don't want that result, then don't follow it, and you'll experience the opposite because you're going in a way, in, you're living in a way that violates the way reality is actually structured, including yourself. So the point here is that 
that descriptive reality is actually meaning, the meaning of the word Torah. The word Torah actually means directions. Directions are always supposed to be taking you somewhere. And it's not, we're not trying to go to heaven here. We're trying to become fully alive. We're trying to become fully alive. Now, that fully alive means I'm not scared. I'm not insecure. I'm not lost. I'm not confused. I understand wh who I am, where I'm going, what I'm trying to create, what my life is kind of about, what my powers are, what my tools are in a way that is integrated and put together. And that's really what the Torah is supposed to do. And so philosophy is much more fragmented. It doesn't relate to all of those things. And so that's, that distinction is really a, a very important one in terms of proscription versus description. Uh, description is if I just tell you this is the layout of the land, so then you're like, oh, well, if I want to get from here to there, this is what I have to do. That's you. You own that process then. If I tell you do this, do this, do this, do this, so then you're going to just be like, well, why would I want to do those things? How, I don't see it myself how it's going to get me there which is why the Torah is also ultimately the most empowering uh, system or tool you could use because telling people what to do works when they're five, maybe when they're 10, but showing people what reality is in a way that is descriptive and open and genuine is empowering them. It says to them, here, let me teach you about what things are and now you can do whatever you want to do with that information and go and become who you, the best you you can be and I'm going to get out of your way. That's an incredibly empowering thing to do. A true parent does that. They start off telling the kids what to do because the kid doesn't have enough understanding. And then you just get out of the way and just make sure that you're constantly teaching them what you see as the reality. And you have to better make sure that as a parent, they, the information that you're getting and that you're transmitting is accurate. Otherwise, you're causing damage as well. So let's read a little more and see how this plays out, the distinction between philosophy and um, this descriptive perspective. So more than above philosophy is so diyut. What is that? It in its own nature, it penetrates all of the depths of all thoughts, all the feelings, all the habits, all the aspirations, all of the layers. Meirosha, so from top to bottom, which means that the so diyut really encompasses all that whole internal world going all the way into its depth. All the things that are kind of hidden from philosophy, the, the, like just the, the underlying mechanics of how we do things and why and how we work in a way that's very uh, visceral, very personal, not just like over there, oh, morals, do the right thing. You don't want to do the right thing. It's hard for you. You have an evil, an evil inclination. These are very distant philosophical ideas that evil inclination, maybe we can connect to it a little bit, but it's also so vague and there's so much more written about this thing that's called the Yetzirah in, in the Torah and in the Kabbalah and in the Gemara. And so this, those pieces that are not discussed will show how this is actually not like me just telling you you have an evil inclination. It's actually that you can learn to understand how you're structured on the inside and why you operate the way that you do. So that's what this is supposed to do. It's supposed to penetrate all those things. It recognizes, and it recognizes the, the unity, the connection between all of that, that is in existence. In both the tangible and the intangible. In its small parts and its large parts, it's an internal recognition. You sort, of, you sort of grasp how things work. Oh, that's why I do that. Oh, that's how I work. And if you learn Kabbalah in this way, this, these types of thoughts and this type of structure, so then you will develop tremendous self-awareness. You also, it's like going to therapy because you unlock all these things inside yourself that you're like, oh, so that, that really shows me like why I do that and why I always interact with my wife or my husband or my, my child or my friends or my boss, like I see all the different parts now. It's kind of laid out in front of me and now I can kind of decide to be, to kind of adjust things and there's so many tools here that can be used. We're going to need to talk more about the tools as we go just because uh, we have to actually learn how to apply some of these things more and more accurately. I'm trying to sprinkle in a lot of different examples to sort of help create insight along the way, but obviously there needs to be uh, more focus as well as time passes. And we'll see as Rav Cook himself develops, because we're trying to follow the books. Obviously, the whole point here is to read through Rav Cook's writings. There's no real small and large. Everything is kind of uh, important in the system. It's valued according to its specific value. There's no pointless movement. There's no nullified perspective. There's no aspect here that is like irrelevant, which is also uh, a kind of like a very different take on a very old idea that's usually thrown around in the culture as well. The idea being that we say things like there's nothing in creation that, that's not important. Everything has a place. And yet we don't really buy that because we're kind of like, yeah, I mean, I guess I, that in a general, because we teach in a very general sense. Well, everything matters. Every little thing has means something and every, every idea. But it's hard to sort of relate to that kind of thing in a general sense because we don't really experience it personally in the same way. It's I'm prescribing a reality. I'm telling you this is what it is. 
And what here we're talking about here is we're sort of saying when you learn this way and you sort of see how things are structured, you really see how every part fits. Like there's no part that's more important because again, proscriptive approaches create hierarchies. By definition, if I'm telling you what you have to do, I'm above you, you're below me, you have to do what I'm telling you, and then you're gonna to start to read reality in the same way. There's things that are more or less important. That what we're saying here is that there's actually a structure where all things have their place. Every piece has its spot, has its role, and when you sort of see the world that way, you learn to sort of value things that is very much more, again, the same way we were talking about two, uh, two or three prokem ago, uh, in a softer way, because it's kind of like, instead of feeling like, well, like, like this thing is not valuable enough, I can just ignore it, it's not important. So instead we say, well, in the scheme of things, I need to sort of relate to this this much, and this this much, and if I kind of do it the other way, then it's gonna cause damage. You kind of learn to value and prioritize things according to their true value, as opposed to according to some random or culturally inculcated or confused standard that is used. And so you can have, you know, if you have a giant focus on a very small thing, so that's something which is just gonna be out of context, it's gonna be out of sync with what's real. And instead of what we're saying is like, let's, let's have the right amount of focus on each part of reality according to its uh, centrality to the system. And then, but no part is negated. There's nothing you ever ignore. Each part has to be related to. So let's, uh, let's go a little further. Uma ze and Kate's laolios. According to, like, and, and in addition, or kind of contrast to this, there's no end to how to how many layers there are of reality like this. There's no idea or, or structure, thought structure or set, set of rules that does not have above it a more general or broader or more universal set of rules that contains within it those subcategories going up and up and up and up. Um, that's kind of like when you look at it from above going down, so these look like they're much less. They're dark, they're darker, they're they're less um they're less broad, they're less large. But if you look Keter Elyon, even the top layer is called Keter Elyon, the Ihu Ortzach, that's like the brightest. So if you kind of, the analogy is using now is that going up in layers, so the higher layers are gonna be called brighter. And that's because the more intangible you go in the structure, the analogy of aura of light kind of becomes more prep, more prominent because we're saying intangible means things that you can't see, but there are things that you see things in their light. So that means that like there's more light the higher you go in the layers. So the top layer in the in the Kabbalah writings is called Keter Elyon, and it's really analogous to your core perception, the perception that is before all other perceptions. You could think of it as every perception is kind of like a set of rules. So again, when you're like going into a restaurant, so you have a certain set of rules that you think to yourself, it's called your Chachma. The Chachma of the restaurant is that you sit in a certain way, you eat in a certain way, you give a tip in a certain way, you order, there's like a whole set of, of rules and requirements of how it works. And the school or has the same thing, and you know, your job and your home, each of these things, there's certain rules and regulations that kind of encompass that area. So what we're saying here is that uh, above all, each one, there's one total set of rules that encompasses all those sub-settings and sub-scenarios. And that total set of rules is called Keter Elyon. It's like the ultimate uh, lens that you use to evaluate all of reality. And the idea here is you want to try to develop that ultimate lens so it's in harmony with the ultimate perspective of reality. The ultimate perspective of reality, the Keter Elyon on the macro side of things, we're talking about the, ma the micro right now, your micro Keter Elyon, the macro side of things is uh, what's called Reishis Chachma Yira Hashem. If you define what Yira means, it does not mean fear, but just for one line right now, Yira means awareness of the presence of another self. Yira Hashem means awareness of the presence of Hashem's self as the self of all selves. And so the, the perspective of there is one self that is behind all things, and that we have to, of course, have a pretty nuanced and deep understanding of what a self is. But if you have that, and that's how your perception is, that means that your Keter Elyon will be in harmony or on the same track as and evolving towards more and more accurately uh, reflecting the Keter Elyon that is behind all of reality. That's kind of what he's referencing here, that uh, the deeper you go with these things, always more and more layers inside yourself on the micro level and also on the macro level. Uh, so he said that, that, that layer, that top layer is the brightest. Or Metzuchzach, it's very, it's completely clean and pure. Still, that uh, lens, the tricky part about this is that Keter Elyon is the top of the hierarchy of tools in, um, in, the, in the world of tools. The thing is that the self, it's called the Neshama, so that is completely beyond tools. There's no, that's something which is so totally in, intangible that it can't really be uh, viewed as a thing. So Keter is a very, like your perceptions are very intangible. 
but there's still it's still a thing conceptually there's still a perception it's a, it's a we can kind of define that in a certain way but the self which is kind of looking at the world through the lens cannot be defined in any way so similarly with the macro level so the keter elyon that Hashem uses so is incredibly bright light just it's so intangible just like your keter elyon and yet when compared to the ila shalkola ilos the that that means the primal cause the cause of all causes so on the macro level, that's talking about Hashem. On the micro level, it's talking about your, your Neshama. But on the macro level, it's talking about Hashem. So the Keter is dark compared to that. It's, we're saying it's so bright and so lit up. And yet compared to that, it's just dark. Because The reason it's dark is because that is the light of that is is uh, is endlessly more powerful. Because all all lights are, are viewed as dark when compared in, in front of the Elosh that, Elos, that self that is you know beyond uh, all the tools. So that's uh, that's just the layering that we're talking about again in this in the structure here. Um, let's just go on to the next page. From this uh, advantage that this you know that the 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 specialness of this whole world of sod, um, the intangible shall he shall he shall he's um, all of the and the, the kind of integration of all the of all the thoughts and all the all, sparks. Nitzot always means like again sparks similar to light. It's like Sparks of the intangible that are kind of uh, bursting into existence in these waves. Raki Hena Mesugelos Ladrachaklas, only that approach, that perspective, can give like a generalized or universal hadracha, like instructions or directions on where to go. And this is a big problem because uh, we tend to tell people what they should do. This is what he should have done. No, why did the president do that? He should have done this. And we're so quick to tell people what we think they should have done, working with, not, and not remembering that what we're doing is we're kind of working with our own life. And we just plunk ourselves into their situation and say, my life, what I would do in that situation. But that's such a silly thing because our life, our, our situation does not apply to that situation in the same way. It's always different. And the only thing you can really do something like that is when you're talking about a perspective and a system that is in, intrinsically universal in all ways. So that way, whatever is in the system will apply to every person the same. That's, what we're, that's why we're saying this is a description of reality. It's because what, what, a description of reality is applicable to all people by definition because it's just what it is. It's not something which is like you just decided things should be a certain way. You're gonna t- I'm gonna tell you how it should be. It's just what is. So what is is always applicable to everyone because it's just that's how things are. So that's what we're saying here. This is the only thing. Rahi heina mesugelos la Only this can be applied in a general way to every situation. Only sod is really the core of true loyalty to Hashem and to reality, to, to what actually is. It's the, it's the core of the, of the Torah. It's kind of like the underlying essence of all, of all that is revealed. All that is defined, that is structured, that is understood in principles, and that, that is done in physical actions. In other words, all that is on the tangible side of things is rooted in this essential, uh, intangible side. And if you try to confuse those two things, so you're going to run into all these problems. This oneness, this pervasive oneness uh, of the of the world, the world of Raz, of secrets, of Sod, it includes all um, things that are in creation. All, all aspects of the of thinking and feelings. All different expressions, forms of expression, whether it's singing or, or, or just sharing verbally. All tendencies of, of, of those that are alive, that are dynamic, that are conscious and, 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 and um, proactive. All, all aspirations and hopes. All, all trends, all directions, all, all, uh, all ideals. From the, from the very root all the way to the top, which is just the same language, just kind of flipped over of the intangible going to the tangible. The kind of like the essence of life of that ultimate top of the the, the 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 intangibly divine cause of things only only um, the shine the brightness of nevuah the nevuah means like the welling up of the intangible consciousness that we that we that we describe as the self of all selves when that wells up in someone it's called nevuah so the shine of that nevuah of that welling up of that self and that's the here, the clarity of perspective that, that comes with that. Zihara the other that's that's the same light as other Marishon, because it's Hashem's Hashem's Nishama, the self that is that we each each of us has that is linked to Hashem's self of all selves, that is when, when you're really in sync with reality this way, then it shines out in a very bright way. 
That's called Zihar the Adam Arishon. It's described that Adam Arishon was basically glowed because of that. The Oros um, and that's the light of all that is above and beyond. That's the intangible uh, facets um, that are kind of in the intangible side of the structure. Yichol and only that will really reveal this essence, this side of things. Shotef the Over Hu Bakol, and then that it will kind of wash over and fill all things. It kind of does. It already does. In all the different directions of the heart and of the of the of the self, the word ruach kind of means like your your evolving dynamic consciousness. But we're going to leave out the specific terminologies for now. Rak sod siach elyon who mechalik es only only that that's that world of sod sod siach elyon the 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 sod that is being expressed about what is actually in that part of reality. That's what kind of organizes the different parts or or paths or sections segments. My uh, what are you gonna what are you gonna kind of calculate as being the the most important or the beginning point the starting point my what's kind of like the ending point where does unit unification um, not belong because it's kind of like a different status type of construct where basically where each thing belongs which part kind of goes above that that part so fair and before one, what do you count as a line from the, from the um, I forget where it is, Hanad of Eliyahu or maybe Tikkun Ezor, one of the, the Kabbalah writings um, from Chazal that's, uh, that says, Yifnei Echad so fair, what do you count before the number one? And uh, that's really referencing the fact that things that are on the intangible scale at the level of Nishmasin, Nishmasin, the level of Ilui, uh, uh, the, the, of what's, what he calls the Siach Elyon, and the, in the previous paragraph also, the Gova Elyon, Ilui HaElohi, those are things that uh, you can't quantify in any way. They're not quantifiable. They are so intangible that they are. They even make Keter Elyon look like it's dark. And Lifnei Echad Mata Sofer really means that uh, there's nothing to count before the number one. Uh, that just means that um, if you actually just from a conceptual place, it's also true mathematically, uh, it's like the number zero. Number zero is not a quantity. It's a non-quantity. It's an impossible number. It's something which is uh, it's a mathematical oddity in a way. If you try to divide by the number zero, so it's undefined. It's not. It's it's a it's, an, it's a marker in a system of numbers where every other number going to either side of zero, plus or minus, so those are all quantifiable values, whereas zero is a non-value, and yet somehow it's still in the chain of numbers. It's what makes the number system into a number system. You have to have a structural order like that with a zero in there to make numbers even mean anything. Otherwise, there's no able, ability to relate one number to another number because you have to have a, a non-quantity as the base for all the other numbers. So, otherwise, try subtracting, you know, 5 minus 4 when there's no 0. So, it's all the numbers on the right side, which are infinite, minus all the numbers on the left side, which are infinite, so that you'll never have uh, a real value to any of those quantities. But once you have a 0, it makes every number mean something. And that's pretty weird because uh, it's a non-quantity in a quantity system. And that's really what we're describing here. We're talking about a reality in which all the quantities in reality, the tangible parts of reality, only mean something because there's a non-tangible reality that is kind of manifest as and connect to and contrast it with the quanti the quantifiable side of things. And so this is really kind of re referencing that structure, that concept that outside of quantities there's just no, just, there, there's no way to even talk about uh, quantifications in the same way. It's a different way of thinking. And that is Perak Zion.